Hello and welcome again to Bible Class Topics. Today we continue our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And this is an appendix to our first lesson. Um, you don't have to watch this video to understand what's going on in our study of the letter to the Ephesians, but it's interesting that when I'm studying or preparing a lesson that later, after I'd already prepared the notes for the Ephesians, I came across uh, a chapter in uh, this book right here, Inspiration and Authority of the Scriptures by Jimmy Jividen. And I believe it's on page 96, 97, and 98, in which he describes the rise and fall of the church at Ephesus. So we're going to take just a few minutes today and kind of look at his outline and see, see where he was coming from when he described this rise and fall. So we start with Paul at Ephesus. It's chapter 18 and we'll read verses 19 and 20. They came to Ephesus, that is Paul and his entourage, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews and when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. Meanwhile, Priscilla and Aquila remain there. Paul goes on to Jerusalem, and Apollos is converted. Let's keep reading. When he had landed at Caesarea, let's see, we... 18, we're going to read uh, 21, which we already read, down through 26. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man. He was competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Paul leaves. His friends and fellow tent makers Priscilla and Aquila remain in Ephesus. Apollos comes and he's preaching the word, except for he is confused about baptism for remission of sins. He's still preaching the baptism of John the Baptist instead of the baptism of Christ. So Priscilla and Aquila take him aside and they explain things to him more accurately. And as far as we can understand, uh, Apollos continue to preach at Ephesus in Paul's absence. Now moving into chapter 19 we see that Paul converts 12 men and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, now this is years, this is later, uh, the, the jump in time between chapter 18 and chapter 19 is possibly a year, Apollos has moved down to Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying, and there were about 12 men in all. So the church is established. Paul leaves. Perhaps within a year he returns. He converts 12 more men, and the church begins to grow. And part of that growth is caused by the fact that, or I should say probably most of that growth, is caused by the fact that Paul preaches there up to about two years. Continuing in chapter 19, 
And he entered the synagogue for three months, spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So we see that Paul is very instrumental in not only starting the Ephesian church, but in its growth and expansion as other churches begin to show themselves in that part of Asia, or Asia Minor as, as we usually refer to it. Now let's move forward into Acts chapter 20. And we see that Later, Paul calls the elders down to Miletus for a meeting, and this is where he talks about the wolves in sheep's clothing. So Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. He told them, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Remember, he is talking to the elders of the Ephesian church. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears." So earlier we said he stayed there at least two years, and from Paul's own lips we see the total of his stay at Ephesus was apparently up to three years. That brings us to our letter of, uh, to the Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you've been reading along with me already this morning, let's turn to Ephesians 6. And we'll start with verse 11. Paul writes the letter, and it contains warnings against what we'll call passive neglect. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm getting over a terrible allergy attack. But I'm on the mend. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And we'll stop there. So, passive neglect in other words, just not doing anything about problems is going to lead, Paul, Paul tells his Ephesian brethren, is going to lead to more problems. Paul also writes First and Second Timothy while Timothy is at Ephesus. And this is, this is later. And we'll see that certain men were teaching strange doctrines. Let's go to 1 Timothy. We'll begin in chapter 1 and verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God, that is by faith. Later on in that chapter, he mentions two men by name. If we go on down to verse 19, well, let's verse 18. 
This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So problems have, have arisen even in this short period of time at the church at Ephesus. And so we say apostasy is on the horizon. Then if we turn over to chapter 4 of 1 Timothy in verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and by prayer. Moving on over into 2 Timothy, things apparently had not gotten any better and had actually... Uh, become worse. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a few verses from chapter 4. Do your best to come to me soon. This is verse 9. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. And I just read the wrong verse, so let's. I'm not going to. I'm not starting a new video. So here we go. Chapter, Second Timothy, chapter four, verse one. I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is judge to, to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And then, the last we hear of the church of Ephesus in the New Testament comes from Jesus Christ himself, uh, as related by John in the Revelation. So we'll turn to Revelation chapter 2 and we'll look, uh, actually we'll start in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is John quoting Jesus in this letter to the Ephesian church. I, that is Jesus, know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. These are some good things that Jesus is saying about the church at Ephesus. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But... I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So they had left their first love, and their lampstand was in danger. What Jesus is trying to tell the Ephesian church is how... The church was established and how Paul had laid out how they should operate is how they should continue to make converts and how they should continue to operate. And yet, someone has come in and told them that there's a better way than the way they had first been taught and now they're getting this warning that they must return back to the beginning and do things the way they were instructed in the beginning by Paul. The general epistles of John also address problems that were found within the Ephesian church. 
And though not specifically addressed to that congregation, there are some commentators that believe these three short epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, were circulated throughout the area of Asia Minor, which does include Ephesus. Let's look at 2nd John. Uh, and remember, 2nd John has just the one chapter. Uh, so 2nd John, and we're going to look at uh, 9 uh, verse 9 through 11. Everyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. And so the tone of this from, from John is very similar to the tone from Jesus. Some people are going to come along and they're going to be bringing you what they say is the gospel, which is not going to be the gospel. And when they do, John says, you need not to extend your right hand of fellowship to these people. You need to avoid them at all costs and do not let them teach in your assemblies. So here we've taken just a quick look at the beginning of the church of Ephesus, how things went along while Paul was there for up to three years, how after he left things began to de degenerate. He had to have a parley with the Ephesian elders and warn them that things were not going to stay the same and even some of them could cause the problems. Jesus Christ himself, through John the Revelator, gives them a letter and says basically the same thing that Paul said. People will come and they will try to teach what they say is the gospel, but is not the gospel. So, I hope that this helps you understand where the Ephesian church began, how, where they were at the point of time when Paul decided to write his letter to the Ephesians, and with this background, we'll continue uh, with our verse-by-verse -verse study in the near future. Thank you for watching. You know, your support is very important. If you would subscribe to the channel, it would be greatly appreciated. If you would like or di even dislike this video, it would help with the YouTube algorithm of getting this uh, video out there. Also, if you would be willing to share uh, this video with a friend or a loved one or a neighbor, I would certainly appreciate it. And if you could talk, if you are a subscriber, thank you so much. And if you could talk someone else into subscribing, I really, really would appreciate it. Until we meet again, may God bless.